Okay, we are in session 35, which is the last in the series. Uh, we'll cover some of the overviews on SSIS and SSRS. In this session, we will see uh, what is an ETL and uh, how can we use SSIS uh, to accomplish an ETL task. And uh, client-side reports using crystals and uh, RDLCs, uh, we'll see that as well as server-side reports using SSRs. So these are the very key things that we will be looking at today. And uh, also we'll see how can we deploy the SSRs reports to an SSRs server. And also look into the SSRs subscriptions and what are they and what are the different types of subscriptions available and how can we use them in the real-time world. Okay, so let's kick off session 35, uh, our final session in this series. So, so we're going to continue with our um, data integration and reports. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to be kind of a overview session, uh, not completely a deep dive, but uh, definitely a productive one. I um, did have a good amount of data to demonstrate a couple of reports and uh, do an SSIS task and things like that. So we'll run through each and every line item from now on. So, so we're going to cover under data integration and reports. And number one is the ETL operations uh, using SSIS. Um, so ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. Um, and SSIS is a Microsoft technology which can be leveraged to do the ETL operations. And we'll see a demo on how we can do that. Followed by a client-side reports using Crystal Reports and RDLCs and also server-side reports using SSRS and deploying the SSRS reports uh, to the server. So we're going to pay more, spend more time on uh, SSRS reports today and of course a little time on the client-side reports. And of course we'll see how to create a reports um, and uh, parameterize reports as well and also how to deploy them to the respective uh, server and how to run them on the server and also how to subscribe the SRS reports. So SRS subscription, subscriptions is uh, one of the very important and bene uh, very beautiful feature. We'll see that as well, all in action. And while talking about all these topics, I'll cover many other topics uh, which are uh, kind of a FYI or tools and tips, okay? And uh, here we are for the first one. Um, the data integration part, the SQL Server 2008 integration services. Uh, in other, in the short form, we know it better by the keyword SSIS. Um, so SSIS is a platform for building enterprise level data integration and data transformation solutions. And uh, so SSIS uh, in general, we know it as an ETL tool and um, SSIS replaced uh, the DTS, which was available in SQL Server in older versions, starting from 7.0 and previous versions. Uh, DTS stands for Data Transformation Services, um, which is uh, which is a very lightweight and very simple one without any much of a complexities in DTS. Uh, SSIS is a very big change um, from DTS, so there is no comparison between the DTS what cap what DTS is capable of versus what SSIS. So SSIS itself is a very huge initiative and we'll see some of them and how huge it is. Apparently I don't have an older version of SQL Server to compare with DTS and it's it's a good thing if you uh, learn more on uh, DTS versus SSIS offline. Um, people do ask the difference between the DTS and SSIS more often in the interviews. So it's a good point to uh, for offline study, okay? Um, and the data integration between a heterogeneous system. So now again, so why is this ETL and why is it so important in the market? And uh, if you uh, check in the, out, uh, in, in the outside world, in the real-time world, uh, ETL is one of the very, very fundamental um, uh, element you will ideally come across in any large-scale applications, especially when it is an enterprise-wide uh, applications. 
uh, wherein we know that in an enterprise uh, scenario you have a lot of uh, systems uh, and the integration between these systems is one of the thing which is which we talked about in the previous session using the services and um, other things so here when it comes for the offline process data synchronization across systems is one of the key thing which is achieved using various ETL tools so in the market there are a wide variety of tools available and when we come to Microsoft Microsoft toolset SSIS is the tool set that is available for ETL operations again SSIS is not only for ETL operation that's a very key distinction you need to keep in mind uh, SSIS using SSIS you can do so many things um, uh, in general you can also do a deployment of a uh, web application using an SSIS so for SSIS developers uh, out there this statement might be a little weird for them because they nobody normally use SSIS for deployment purpose um, so de for deployment you use a deployment scripts so or and or Microsoft deployment build scripts and other things but for you can still make use of its size what it means is uh, uh, what does a deployment does it just uh, unzip or uh, zip uh, unzip the uh, deployment release candidate to the respective server which is nothing but a file transfer or file copy file operations in general you can do it in a size as well as uh, you want to deploy a database to a given database server that also you can do uh, it has a strong uh, integration between the file system as well as the databases as well as various other forms of data whichever format you specify in the world it could be a CSV file an XML file or a data source uh, coming from a uh, an Oracle or a SQL server or even any 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 data data source you name so we'll see most of those things so it's a very wide set of features available so so we'll walk through what is an ETL exactly so uh, in an enterprise world you'll see the different types of data um, sitting in different applications which could be a re relational database um, model as well as ERP systems or a flat file in general so this is a very common thing that you will come across whenever you integrate with uh, legacy applications uh, like the mainframes or uh, any other applications you name in the legacy world so it's how it's difficult for you to have a uh, web interface between the legacy application to the new world applications so the data integration becomes a critical thing so the flat file medium is the best way you can actually integrate with the data so it could be a CSV file or an XML file it could be anything okay so so that's where the various source of data you need to actually um, have consolidated that data into one area at the end for for many reasons it could be for reporting sake or it could be for uh, for making the data available globally or consolidate the data so that other applications can consume it and it's a very common thing that you will normally see so ETL is a very general keyword it's not specific to Microsoft or any other things it's a, it's a general computer side uh, elements that you normally come across so you're using um, uh, the one of the one of the major uh, tool again available in the market is Informatica most of you might have heard about the Informatica from IBM so that's one of the tool available for ETL operations similarly and there are wide wide, wide variety of uh, systems available so for our focus we will talk about the size in general so what E stands for in ETL so e, e is the first element which is talks about extract data from any transaction systems or various platforms or various formats as we just talked about it could be RDMS it could be ERP or it could be flat file it could be anything and once you extract that information so you need to transform or clean the data to fit into the consuming system or the target system so we know that different systems might have the different ways of managing the data and storing the data so not all the data that you receive might fit into the system. Uh, a simple example if you can um, uh, look at here is if, uh, if you're getting a phone number from an external system, the phone number, uh, if a phone number is one of the very complex field you can imagine when you talk about a global data. 
So phone number can have a, a country calling code and also the area calling code and the phone number. So if you look at the format in which the phone number can be constructed for a global data, when you say global, you're talking about all the countries in the world and all the uh, cities and the respective regions within that. So, so it itself is complex in nature if you talk about just one specific country. If you talk about India as a country, a uh, specific phone number, you can imagine, right? So, uh, yeah, you have a mobile number, which is a 10-digit phone number, and as well as you have a landline number. So, you can imagine the kind of complexities it can uh, come into. So the transformation or cleaning aspect comes into that area wherein you might want to slice and dice and uh, extract the information. You might want to clean up the data. For example, you don't want to have a spaces within the numbers in, in a phone number case. Some might have stored it with the spaces to have their format, specific, uh, local, regional spe specific format. And uh, at the end system, you don't want any spaces or special characters. You want to trim them off. So those kind of cleaning activities or transforming the data types as well <clears throat> in general. So in this case, again, it's the best example, phone number, if it is having a spaces or special characters like hyphens between the phone numbers, all that uh, will make it as a string in the, uh, in the source system. But you might want to convert the whole thing as a new number to the destination system for some reason. Okay, you might want to make it as a number. So there's a data conversion activity involved in that. And also another key thing in the transformation is uh, since you're getting data from different systems, um, then you might want to merge the data between various different sources into one form and then load it. So all the merging activity or cleaning activity or, or data, data conversion activities, all that kind of various activities can fall under your transformation. So, so you extract, transform, and then finally you load it. So load into your target system. So the, finally, the processed data will be loaded into the, uh, in this case we are showing uh, EDW. This is one of the good diagram, the good picture I found on the internet. So I try to reuse it here. And EDW stands for Enterprise Data Warehouse. So large scale enterprise applications do have a very large database and the large database is managed using the enterprise data warehouse. And of course, once you have the data in place, so you might use the data for various uh, purposes. In this case, in this, di this diagram show a cube at the end. So cube in general represents an uh, SSAS activity, otherwise analytical activity wherein you, you want to show the data that is received in various different uh, measures or KPIs, uh, which is completely related to the data warehouse reporting, uh, EDW reporting, uh, cubes and other things. So, uh, which is again a very hot uh, in the market anyway. So, uh, of course, in in SQL Server, in the, in the latest SQL Server 2012, uh, which is called um, Codename Denali, um, you have a very strong uh, uh, features introduced for uh, pivoting the data and presenting it in uh, different measures, in other words, warehouse reporting. So earlier, this used to be called a DAX, D-A-X, as a uh, language that you need to write to generate the cubes out of the data. Uh, now it's more simpler. You can use a general spreadsheet and connect to the database and create a cube data out of it so that you can see the uh, data visualized for decision making at the end. In general, for if you're completely new to all these keywords, so in the real business sense, if you talk about the cubes or EDW data, if you think about um, a government firm, a government, a daily we, we see uh, statistical data like you have uh, so many male, so many female, uh, there is a male-female ratio or um, the uh, ec um, in terms of um, uh, monetary system, if you, if you think, uh, look at this inflation, this percentage of inflation got increased or decreased on a certain commodity. So all these statistics you'll see as analytical data. So, so to achieve that given number, you have to process the data across the whole nation or across the world to get to a number and what's that single number will translate uh, the lot of activities that's happening. Um, so 
you can imagine the data coming from a different sources. It could be millions of billions of records of data coming in. You process the whole data and present a single number. So that's called analytical processing of data. So it's normally referred to as a warehousing uh, reporting tools uh, that you can use. Or KPIs is, um, are the key indicators. Right? Uh, it, uh, will determine these numbers or you have measures, KPIs and other things that's a completely warehouse reporting stuff which we don't want to get into too much. Okay, okay so that's all uh, about the ETL operation in general. We'll jump into the ETL in SIS. We'll, um, uh, I'll do a demonstration on how we can do that. So f to uh, help with our demonstration I have a, a data file, our HR data. Um, so I'll open this file and uh, show you first how what what kind of data we have. So this is a flat file data. This is actually CSV file data, which is comma separated value. To better show that, probably I can open this in a notepad because uh, your spreadsheet is well capable of um, showing the uh, data in uh, rows and columns. So this is how the flat file look like. So this is how the data has come into your system. So we the the task that we're going to do right now is load this file, uh, transform it, we'll do some kind of a business transformation and then finally load it into our SQL Server database. Okay, that's what we're going to do uh, using SIS. And uh, first thing, if you're completely new to a CSV format, um, then uh, I'll just have one minute uh, to cover how the CSV file looks like. In this case, I have the first record as the header information, where I have the the first name, middle name, last name, all the header information, in other words, column information is available. And down the line, I have the data, okay, from row number two onwards. And uh, each of the column values are separated by a comma. That's why it's called a comma separated value, CSV. And uh, we will load this data using our SIS. How can we do that? So. We'll jump into coding now. So if you take a look at, um, we'll go ahead and um, zoom up here. And I'm using SQL Server 2008. And I'm going to make use of the first SQL Server database. OK. OK, so I just opened the, um, yeah, I just opened the SQL Server database now. I'm connecting to my. Uh, database engine and uh, to make sure we have a database created first because this is the place where we're going to uh, store our data. So I'm going to create a new database by right clicking on the databases and new database. Okay and I will just name this as my HRDB. Okay this is just a name and I'll take the rest of the things as default and say okay everything else is default and I just created a brand new database here it doesn't have any tables within it of course it has system tables which we are fine with that so to take a close look so I could just create this table uh, database without any tables within it okay this is where I am going to load the flat file data that we just see here okay I'll just close the CSV hope you understood what the CSV format looks like and of course when we talk about relational database model it's all um, rows and columns right um, so now we'll jump into creating the exercise package in bids yeah so if you take a look at this this is the uh, bids in the short form in other words called as a SQL server business intelligence development studio so this is a this will ideally look like a Visual Studio in general. So it's a little different from Visual Studio, and we'll talk about those things uh, down the line. But right now we focus on creating a a project, a new project in bits. We are doing uh, bits. Uh, if you take a look at this, this is the separate uh, set of projects called business intelligence projects, and within that we have a couple of projects here which we are going to see today um, is the in integration services project and also the reports of our project. So reports is the next step we will go in. Uh, so we'll 
start with uh, integration services project which is called SSIS project okay and I'll keep the name um, simple default and say okay so once I create this project I see a couple of things here the more the most important thing is a DTSX file so this is your uh, as I mentioned DTS if you remember DTS is the old name for the same transformation services and SQL server so SSIS is uh, the next to DTS and, and, and hence they just added X which stands for extensible which is the most, most common thing we know so the package extension is a DTS X okay it's not SSIS okay that's a very important thing people do normally try to pull your leg uh, will say what is a package file extension in general so DTS X is uh, um, so for that okay so this is a package and as you see that it's a plain open um, uh, space here and nothing is there and we have a couple of things like data sources data source views and miscellaneous okay we will not go into all of that because since we know we just this is just a um, scratching the surface and we're just trying to accomplish a very simple task um, and not everything okay Okay, to start with, on the left hand side, if you see, there are various uh, tasks that you can perform on, on the control flow. So the first part is the control flow. This is the entry point for your package. Uh, that's where we landed here. And within the entry point, you can do all of these tasks. Uh, what are these tasks? If you just take a, uh, you have a container wherein you can have a for loop and um, in other words, if you visualize like your C sharp code writing the loops and other things, um, the same thing you can do by picking the right component onto the so you don't write any code in general ex except there are a couple of expressions. Otherwise, everything else is a control here. Okay, so we, instead of getting into too many details of what all available on the left hand side, which will be more detailed session, um, I will uh, straight away jump into my data flow task. Uh, which I am more interested at this point. So, so this is the task that I will pick whenever I want to do with the data manipulation or data transformation things. So that's the reason I mentioned as science is not exactly or specific to ETL, uh, it is meant to do many other things actually. So in general, if you, if you take a look at it, it can do the analysis services as well. You can do an FTP task wherein you can download a file and there is a file, this file system task wherein you can manipulate files using that task and uh, transfer database tasks, you can move a database from one place to another place, a lot of things. So it's not just an ETL, it is more than ETL. Okay, so we will just see the ETL part of it today. Okay, so data flow task, uh, once you have this control here, you just have to go and double click on that. It will take you one step down into this, that's called the data flow. So what are the things that you want to do in the data this task? So once you get into the next tab, you also see that the left hand controls also have changed. So they are grouped into three main things. One is the source, transformation and destination. So this exactly represents to your um, ETL, right? So this is E, this is T and L. So that's what we are. So the source is here, the transformation is here and the destination is here. So in this case, my, uh, my intention is to load the CSV file. So for that, what is the data source best fit here? If you take a look at this is a flat file, right? So it's a flat file source. I'm bringing it. So once I have this flat file uh, source here, I go into properties by simply double clicking on it. And I'll see there's a flat file connection manager. And since there is nothing there, I'll create a new. And this is my HR. Uh, data file okay and description I can give the same thing here in the description also doesn't matter and the file name here I'll browse and pick my CTAM test data okay so I just have to check the filters to CSV and my 
I pick my HR data and that's all I need. So since I picked the CSV file uh, by default, it picked the rest of the things called delimited. It, it identified as delimited or a fixed length or a ragged array. So there are different ways you can have the flat file as well. So we don't want to get into too many details there, okay? Since we know it's just an overview. And I go into the columns and I see the columns are identified. And if you notice, my first row has the column header information uh, since uh, it determined, it, it, it could not recognize that first header row and try to create the column 0, 1, 2, 3. So, but this is not what I wanted. So, for that uh, to recognize, there's a checkbox if you see uh, here, it's called uh, column names in the first data row. So, if I check this, then it will recognize the first row I have as a column. So now you can see that the it recognized the first row and created the column for me. Perfect. And another thing here is a header rows to skip. So just in case if you have a flat file that doesn't have a header row in it um, and you know the definition um, because you have the definition for, for various uh, sources. Um, so in that case you can skip the header row and number of rows you want to skip, you can specify here. Okay, and this is a uh, header row delimiter. Uh, this is a call as a new line feed. The delimiter, the, the row level delimiter is a new line character. So that's what it's referring to. Okay, and uh, let's examine the columns and the data that we're going to see. Is there anything that we see some uh, messed up here? So I can see one thing uh, if you take a look at this uh, column although the column is created if you see the data is not actually mapped to the respective column okay so that's one thing even if you see the form phone number I don't see the phone number down the line and uh, and in place of um, um, country I see various different data like so this is all messed up right so it's not what um, what actually it looks like uh, is that a problem with the file or is it a problem with the format the way it is? If I open the spreadsheet, oops, I'm sorry. So if I open the spreadsheet to just to validate, so I don't see that in my spreadsheet. Everything looks perfect. So there's something wrong with my um, transformation. So there is, uh, this is one thing that you need to keep in mind when you play with the CSV file that uh, although it recognizes things, so there are areas where you might Ha end up with troubles. In this case, uh, that's the reason I wanted to open the file in the notepad as well so that we see exactly how the data is constructed. So I'm just using notepad plus plus. So the one key thing if you pay close attention here is that although all our string data, of course in CSV, it everything is treated as string data. It, it doesn't recognize any data type. Um, so everything is string. And if you take a close look at the, we know that it's a comma is a separator for each of the columns. But in some of the columns, if you see the comma is already there, uh, and those are um, encapsulated with a special character here with the double quotes. Okay, so now what's happening here is it's treating only the commas as a delimiter since it's a CSV file and the delimiter we specified as a comma. And it's actually splitting the data elements, of the column data, as well into different columns. So that's where the mess is happening. So to overcome that problem, so there is an option here. If you take a look at this, this is called the text qualifier. So the text qualifier will help you in notifying that. Since we know that there is a, some special uh, character, like a quote here, that's uh, that need to be treated when you when the column data is split across. We need to specify that uh, text qualifier here to help us with the data fixes. Okay, so now you see that there is no problem with the data, right? You have the address got split into the respective columns, and you can see the city properly state into the respective column, and no issue with that. So the country and the email address and everything is properly broken into the respective columns. Okay, hope that helps. And uh, finally, I'll preview the data here and then say okay. So there's nothing else that I would uh, like to worry about. And the next step will be the columns. 
So now uh, we have the file and the columns identified and here you can pick and choose which columns you want to import. Okay. For example, I don't want okay, these phone numbers to be imported to my data file. So I can skip them at this point. Okay, so I don't want to do that. I will take everything at this point and say okay. And of course, there is something called an error output. Uh, this is again a very important thing. If at all, um, if at all there is any uh, mapping issue happens during the during the load or extract process, if any row fails, so what is the action that you want to take is what you want to specify here. So in this case, uh, if you say fail component, then that means the whole trans whole ETL operation, your whole package will fail. If um, if one of the uh, fi first name or field has a problem with the data, so in this case, I, I, I don't want to get into so many details. Okay, let me. S there are three options here. One is ignore failure, which means it's not going to do anything, and redirect redirect row. That means you want to treat you want to capture such failures in a different destination. In that case, you want to redirect the row at this point and take it forward and um, things like that. So. Uh, so to keep our um, overview simple, so I will take, I will select all of these and uh, pick the ignore failure. Okay, we'll demonstrate uh, this at a different stage, but not at this stage. Okay, perfect. So now my file, flat file source is perfectly configured. No, no issues. And as you, may, as you see, you can also see the errors and warnings just like your C-sharp code. You'll see the errors here itself. So imagine uh, writing the same thing in a C-sharp code. You can very well do the ETL operation in a C-sharp code, definitely, right? You can definitely open a file, load it, process it, and transform it, and save it to a database file, which is perfectly doable, and no issue with that. Uh, a size, if you take a look at it, you don't have to write a piece of code. It's all... Um, uh, it's all like you know uh, orchestration wise you just have to pick the respective task and attach it to it so it's very very easy and fast now my data flow source is done I'll get into the transformation so what kind of transformations I'm interested here if you take a look at there are a lot of transformations available here uh, like cash, cash transform or conditional split or copy column and so many things so it will take a lot of time if I want to walk through this so um, to keep our uh, time simple and uh, take a best advantage of it I'll take uh, the conditional split here as an example so what this task will do is uh, in this case oops, probably I can close this window Okay, good. So I have this data. So what I'm interested in doing is uh, I don't want to uh, take any data that has a blank city in it. So that's the business rule I want to apply on the transform uh, on the extract side. So before, because for me, uh, address without a city doesn't make any sense. That's one of the very simple rule I want to apply. And if I filter the data here and uh, look for the data if it has uh, of course there are a lot of blanks here okay so I there are a lot of records here and uh, if I take a close count to it there are 68 records with blank city out of 17727 records okay so I want to eliminate all these uh, records to get into my resting place where which is your the SQL Server database okay so that's what I'm trying to do here so for that to happen, I'm using a conditional split. So now, this is the source, and if you take a close look at once I put my arrow there, there is a two arrows down the uh, to down. So one is a green, another one is a red. I uh, hope you noticed that clearly. Um, so the green one um, is a plus thing, which will navigate to the endpoint and the other one other one is the error part so if you remember the error one if you say redirect row uh, when you say re redirect row so this is what you're going to use so if you want to redirect it you redirect to a different destination it could be a flat file it could be another da database or something like that in this case since we ignored the errors in the flat file hope you remember what we did with the error output we just ignored uh, all the failures right here 
uh, in just in case if I pick a redirect row, so the, the error records will be redirected to an endpoint like this. So then I can make use of the another endpoint to save that or handle it in a different way. Okay, perfect. So now I'm taking only the positive route, the negative part is already gone. It's simply as like if this condition met, this is what you're going to do, else that. It's like a data flow. Okay, perfect. So now we are in the conditional split. So what we can do here? Um, if we take a look at this, this is the columns that are available. So this is the data structure that's been flowing from my source. And in this case, I'm interested with the city. Okay, so what the condition I want to apply on the city here, okay, like I can simply drag and drop the city here. I have the data element here. So now what is the condition? I want to see that if it is blank. How can I do that? I can do uh, either pick the string functions available within the uh, here. So there are various uh, string functions available. So in this case, I'm interested in uh, checking the length. Uh, just because since we have all these uh, elements as blank, uh, in a flat file, in a flat file, there is nothing called uh, null. If, it, if, your, if your source is from a database, then you might come to come across a null. So in that, in which case, you might want to go with the null, is null. Since my flat file is doesn't have any null, so it's all uh, based on the length. So I pick the length as my uh, operation here. So I'll say length of my city, but it might have uh, spaces so I will uh, trim the spaces uh, see if there is any trim yes there is a trim trim the city and check the length if the length is uh, equal to zero just like a shisha double is equal to and uh, if it is if the length of the city after trimming is zero that means it's a blank okay then what will happen the out, uh, output name will be blank city. Okay, perfect. So that's the simple condition I'm applying here. And if you notice it, soon after I lost my focus from this condition, it's turned out to black. Otherwise, it was in red. Okay, if, you, if I just make a small correction there, if you see the color itself indicates that there is something wrong with the expression. Okay, if it uh, doesn't turn in, in this case, if I just say, okay, it's going to show you the errors. Okay, that's how you're going to evaluate your expression. So it's it's like a compile time error itself in, in C sharp terms. So double is equal to is fine. It turned blank, so it indicates everything is perfectly fine. And, and in this case, we also have an error output here. Uh, there can be error at this point. Uh, then what will happen? Fail the component. In this case, I'll just simply say fail the component. I'll leave it the default. Okay, and the once this check is done, so the rest of the uh, records that doesn't meet this condition will be output as a default output here. And then default output name, you can specify here, saying uh, non-blank city. Perfect. So I have two con uh, condition for uh, check the blank city. And other one is uh, all the remainings are non-blank. Perfect. So I hope you're clear with this. So this is where the conditional split. Of course, you can add as many conditions you want. Uh, in this case, you can keep on adding as many things as possible. Okay. Uh, for example, a simple case in my uh, uh, data, if I, I see non-blank there, and I'll also see a lot of uh, city names here. So if I want to say Chennai need to, all the records that have a city name called Chennai need to go into a different file, then you can do that as well by checking this city name is equal to Chennai and redirect as a second or output name. You can do as many as you want to. Okay, we'll keep this to simple here. So now we have a conditional split now. So now again, as we see, there are two outcoming, outcoming points there. So we need to uh, you make use of them. So this is the transformation part is done. Now uh, we'll get into the next one. The data flow destinations. In this case, uh, I want to uh, take the blank records and uh, save it to a, a another CSV file as a flat file. So I'll take the flat file destination. This I can treat it, treat as an error file. In other words, because the, I don't want to have uh, records with the blank city. 
Okay, that's one destination I have. Another destination I want to have is an OLEDB connection, which is kind of talking to the database. One thing with uh, the destination here, you can also see there's a SQL Server destination here, which I could use to connect to the SQL Server. Um, so, um, so SQL Server destination is kind of a deprecated one in SIS 2008. So it's not recommended to use it because this is going to be de deprecated uh, down the line. Now this is available just like a backward compatibility. So the best thing to go in 20, 2008 is OLEDB destination. Okay. And that's one thing, uh, FYI. Okay, now all the uh, non-blank one will go into my database. So as we know that we had just created a database with all our tables, right? So this is what I'm going to make use of it at this point. So, I've, oops, I need to first map these things to the respective destination, first thing. So since it has multiple output points, it's asking you to pick which one you want to take it here. Uh, because I have uh, meaningful names here, now I can understand, okay, non-blank, okay, I want to have non-blank city go to my database. Perfect. And similarly, I'll see another two, and the other one will go, but if, because the rest of the thing remaining is a blank city. Perfect. So now there is one more failure condition, right? Um, in this case, there's the last one, which is a failure one. Um, here, configure the failure one. In this case, what I will do is um, I will say redirect. Or if the red truncation happens, also redirect. Okay. Oops, sorry. So this is the redirect here and apply. So now in this case, if there is any failures happens within this uh, transformation, all that will be redirected. Now soon after I make it redirect, I see the couple of errors down the line because I need to make use of it, otherwise it's going to be an uh, error. So now to make use of that, I'll take another flat file here and drag my error one to it. So this is what, of course, um, I want to make use of it uh, because the error one, error output, is going into my another flat file. And I can, of course, rename it here here as an uh, error file and uh, this one as my blank city and of course this my OLDB we know that we don't have to name it just for our understanding and now I need to configure my error file this is of course uh, as a flat file I want to create a new file for that and if you see Excuse me. Um, I want to make it as another CSV file, so it's a delimited file. I'll say OK. And it's going to ask me to locate a file where I want to write it to. I'll keep it in the same place here as a CSV. I'll say error.csv. Sorry, CSV. OK. So rest all again, it's the same thing. A text qualifier, I know that there. I will have to come across the double quotes because it's there in the source itself. And since we it already have the uh, the schema of the uh, source, you don't have to set anything else. Everything is all taken care. Of. Okay, so let me. I think there is one more. I need to. Okay, so the the column names in the first row I need to have, and that's all. And I'll say okay. Perfect. And also here I have to map do the mappings. This is where the source columns and the destination columns. Um, I want to make use of all of them. So I'll keep all the mappings as is. And it does the mapping by default uh, matching the name of the column here, ideally. Uh, if your source and destination has a different column names, then uh, at this point you have to explicitly map it to them respect to one. So otherwise, in other words, if I take this state, uh, I delete this, um, and yeah, I want to map this, then just have to drag and drop to this state, then it will do the mapping. So it's a simple thing to do. So since my source and destination have the same names, I don't have that issue. I can, it maps by default. I don't have to do anything except click OK. Perfect. My error file is configured. Now my city file. So since it's not configured, if you take a look at it, the error is still there. So it's showing this error mark here that indicates that there's some problem with the respective uh, destination. 
So I'll create a new file for this again, delimited here as well. And uh, in this case, the file name is going to be CSV as well. And I'll say blank city data. Okay. Okay, this dot CSV and say open. And of course, the same thing goes here with the um, code and the column names and say okay. Perfect. Again, mapping must be done. Otherwise, if you see the, the OK uh, button at the bottom is not enabled for you to hit OK. Uh, you need to do the mappings and then only the rest of the things will be OK. And similarly, the last one is OLA destination. This one will talk to the database. <clears throat> By the nature of the task itself, it's OLA DB provider. Uh, it's uh, hit new to uh, do the database connection here. And test DB is the database here. I think I can delete this one. Uh, okay, I'll create a new one and uh, pick my server, which is my. Uh, of course, my server is on the same machine, so I don't have to go anywhere else. So, um, yeah, it's quick enough. I'll pick this SQL Server Express, and I make use of the Windows authentication, which is fine. Or else I can go with my SQL authentication as well. Since I have a separate uh, account created for the database, I can use make use of that. And if I remember correctly, it is yes, RIP, okay, and uh, any and save my password and if the, my authentication is successful it's going to retrieve the database names and in this case I don't see it I think it is this one yeah my bad okay now I able to get the database name here and now I can test the connection the text is successful and that's all I need. So I'm able to successfully connect to the database uh, using my OLEDB database connection. Perfect. So that's done. And now the next step is uh, either pick the respect to a target table. In this case, as we know that we just created a blank database and we did not create any tables. So I don't have to create from my uh, studio. I can go ahead and say new. Okay, there is no sufficient. Okay, that's fine. It's because the table create script is prompted up here I'm going to say my HR data this is a create command you're familiar with the T SQL statement or SQL statement uh, to create the table so I just have to change the name of the table here uh, so that uh, the respective table is going to be created and we already have the rest of the field names with the respective data types as you see since it's CSV all of our chart so all our characters, it doesn't recognize. If at this point, if you want to do any uh, transformation of the database, uh, like if you want to make it as a number or some other field, you can change the script to do it. But in this case, I'm really not worried about it. Okay, so I'll say okay. So it's going to run the script on the database, and uh, by now it should have created. Um, or let me double check if it is created by now itself or it's going to do it. Yep, it's already done. So the table is created for me. Soon after I said okay. And this is the table destination where I want to take it. And again, as you see, the okay button is not enabled. You have to do the mappings. Then only you can do that. As, as we saw in the other one, it's the same thing. It, by default, all the names are mapped. I don't have to do anything else and the error output is there and in this case I will can say ignore failures okay and say okay perfect so my uh, package is done so is there anything that I missed out here nothing so it's this is what I, uh, ETL operation we're doing and if you take a look at this uh, so this is the sorry yeah this is the uh, e operation here going on and this is the transformation we're doing and at the end we are doing at this point we're doing the load so ETL operation is done in this package okay now we will just go ahead and run this package so by clicking the execute task and uh, there is a problem with the source the red indicates that there's a problem 
we'll see what's the problem by hitting the log. Oh, it's ended up there and we can see the execution results. And this tab, we'll see the what's the problem with the error. The process cannot access the file because it's been used by, uh, it cannot be able to access the file because it's been used by other process. That's simply because the file is actually opened in my not another notepad and as well as here. So I'll just close this without saving anything. Hope the lock on the file is released now and we're going to run this package once again. Okay, so this time all are green and uh, if you take a look at this, we have the 68 count. Uh, as we see, uh, the number of blank records we saw was 68 and now we see the 68 records went into the blank destination and the remaining all the 17659 rows went into my database and with respect to the error there's nothing okay so nothing has failed so nothing went into the error file so i'll stop the execution and i can go and go ahead and hit the execution results tab here and see the status or the execution steps that it took to do the processing and if there are any issues as we just saw if there are any errors in between then you can see the error information here and uh, also you can see the time it took to process the whole file so it roughly took around uh, 10 seconds to process uh, 17,000 records um, uh, one thing and another thing is uh, the SIS package or the application that I'm running is I'm running in 32-bit although if you run the same thing in 64-bit uh, uh, SSIS task then it will be much much faster than this one in other words you can process it's capable of processing 1 million of records so uh, in around uh, 15 or 20 seconds or less than a minute in general so 20 or 25 seconds in other words so that fast uh, that's how it, it's going to be uh, much faster than anything else. Perfect. So um, now let's validate our destinations. So we see that the files got created here and uh, if I open the error file there is no data within, within this because there are no errors and I'll see the blank city. So I see the data uh, here all those uh, 68 uh, fields with the blank city. So all the data with the blank city is in in this file and uh, if I go at the bottom there are 68 records right okay for excluding the first header record 69 minus 1 is 68 okay so this is uh, done successfully in real business case <clears throat> uh, if such data you might want to report to uh, the the source itself uh, to fix it and uh, give the uh, corrected one at the later stage okay so that's how you make use of the output file and now we go into the, our database and query our uh, table here okay so we see the data in, in our database table so I'll exclude the top hundred here or top thousand there and run the statement and I should see the 17659 rows here so perfect so my ETL operation is done successfully without any issues. Hope that's clear and it's very fast and it's very easy as you see. Okay, so now we'll get into our reports part. Okay, so what exactly a report is in general? So we have built an application now and we capture a lot of information. Uh, in other words, I shouldn't say information, but we collect a lot of data. So the data in our database as we just saw looks like this, right, exactly. So will this data make any meaning to anyone in the audience or whoever is intended to? So it doesn't make any sense to anyone unless until it, this data is transformed into an information, right? So information is the key thing for which we do all these hurdles of building an application and collecting the data and processing the data for to meet someone's need which is like serving the information that information can be served in terms of reports so that's why reports are very very fundamental part of any application so name an application there is some form of reports involved if you take a simple example as a retail POS point of sale uh, retail systems 
Uh, once you scan your items, you hit the bill, you get a printout at the end of the uh, your billing cycle, which is a receipt. That's again a report. So uh, similarly, if you take a re registration system, once you put your key in your uh, key data on the web form and hit submit, you might get the summary summary of what you have submitted as an application form, a completed application PDF file outside of the system. So that's the report there. So report you'll see in every system um, in general, but the audience that, it, that each report targets uh, differs in, in a wide variety of ways. Uh, in simple, the bill is a kind of a report that's generated out, which is which the, the intended audience is the customer, a single person, a single indiv individual. Similarly, a registration process uh, gave you an application of completed application form in the PDF form uh, for your records is again targeting a given individual. At the same time, uh, uh, reports uh, summarizing the data across a given period of time. Uh, like at the end of the day, you want to generate a daily cash abstract from the system uh, for a given day, that is important for the store manager. So the manager needs to know how many, uh, how many items they sold at the end of the day and how much money they made uh, uh, during the sales process, how many items got returned and uh, all that kind of statistics you need at the end of the day. And if you take at the regional manager, he wants a different uh, view of the same data. So for the regional manager, he want to see the graph and compare the sales of the uh, given store at a given uh, location uh, for this month and the last month and the last year or previous year. So he want to do uh, the, those statistical analysis and uh, come up with a plan to make sure business runs successfully. And if you take it to the next level, um, an, an industry leader, for example, a retail industry itself, he want to see the data across different uh, retails that's happening in the, uh, in the district or in the state or in the country. So he needs a, a large, he needs to get a very high picture of uh, all these wide variety of data wherein the data warehousing comes into play and all the uh, KPIs, measures, and all the things comes into play. So. Although the reports and the data, underlying data is the same, the way the report is generated and makes a different meaning for the different audience. So that's all about reports, okay? And I know most of you already know about that. Uh, we need, uh, need not expand more on that area. So you're very well uh, aware of what is the report. And we'll come, come back to our development stage. So. In ideally, in a development world, what are the basic elements you see on the face of a report? To see that, uh, this is a, just a snapshot out of a Crystal Report Designer to just explain that aspect here. So the parts of a report. You'll see a header, of course. The header of the report will normally contain your title of the report and its timestamp when it's processed and things like that. So the header of the report will be only printed once throughout the report. It could be n number of pages, but the header will be printed only once. That's what the report header talks about. And the next is the page header. So this section, whatever you put in this section, will repeat for every page in the report. So ideally a page number or a five page, fifth page of an, a total ten pages or you know, things like that if you want to specify here or if you're grouping a data and you want to break the page for every group in that case the page header will show the group information a typical example uh, if you map it to real time world if you see an employees in every department you have 10 departments and you want to see uh, whenever a new department comes in your processing cycle. Uh, every department should start with a new page. So in that case, the, your department will become your page header or for that report or a group header in other words. And details will have the detailed elements uh, that you normally see, uh, line items in the report. And of course, uh, you have a report footer, um, report footer and followed by the page footer. And of course, intermediately you have the group header you, optionally, you can have groups uh, which has a group header and also group footer. Okay, so we'll see that part uh, um, quickly in the 
uh, development cycle. Uh, before we jump into the development of a report, we will need to understand uh, the differences between a client-side reporting versus the server-side reporting. So we have two types of reports right now. So the so we know that the data, if when you talk about the data, data ideally sits in the server side. So when when the data is available in the server side, what do you mean by client side report? So let me try to put it simple. So whenever you say report, it's not uh, report as we see, it just have <clears throat> these elements. Uh, header, footer, and all this, right? So anything that you want to present it, um, the data, if you talk about the data, can be in the server side, definitely, even in, in a real uh, transactional base or data-driven application, the data will be at the server side. But there are so many cases where in the data need not be at the server side. For example, a best example I can take up as a desktop applications, uh, Windows WinForm application, which is running on your local machine, which doesn't have to do anything, to, uh, a case like uh, like it, your application is scanning your local machine uh, just like your McAfee, for example, a good example is a McAfee is scanning your local uh, files and it is reporting you at the end of the scan So these many um, files got infected and these many items so have quarantined and these many inf uh, files have been deleted. Uh, there's a report at the end of the scan process, which has nothing to do with uh, the server side calling. So because all of this data is captured, processed in the desktop, and that's when these reports are called as a client side reports. Okay, although they are same uh, files or same processing mechanism, they have the header, footer, detail, everything. So they need not go to the server to process the report. Uh, and come back. So in general, that those call as a client-side reports. Okay, and uh, as server-side reports, obviously, as we know, that's the most common thing that we see. Any reports that uh, ha that has to do a round trip to the server, uh, although it can be a client-side report way you implement it. Uh, there, we'll see in the next step. Uh, if any report need to reach or make a round trip to the server and process the report at the server side. Um, then that can be called as a server-side reports. Okay, so I hope that's clear. That's a very good uh, di distinction we make there. Uh, and again, so it's it's in, if you map it to the client-side validation versus server-side validation, in our project we did see uh, whenever I make a client-side validation, it doesn't make a round trip to the server. So client-side validation should pass first, then only it will go to the server-side validation. That's the same way it is uh, for reports as well. Um, okay, so client side reports will be processed at the client side, it has nothing to do with the server. And whether server side reports will be running at the processed at the server side and delivered to the client. So it's a request response cycle. And uh, of course, there is a difference in the way uh, you can implement that uh, in report definition files. Uh, the definition of these report files uh, in general, as we see here. Okay, so you can implement the client-side reports using uh, Crystal reports, in which case the, fi the file format will be .rpt. We'll see all of these in action. We'll just after finishing this slide, and uh, in, uh, in in Microsoft technology, if you go with it's an RDLC. It's uh, in other words, RDL is a report definition language, and C stands for client. RDLC. Uh, in short, we can call it as a client report definition. Okay, this is how we can uh, implement the client side reports. Perfect. On the on the right hand side, on the server side reports, you can build using the RDL files, and for this, you need to have the BIDS, which is a Business Intelligence Development Studio, uh, which we just uh, made use of it for business intelligence. You need to have that to create the RDLs. For uh, RDLC, you don't really have to have that. Okay, it's a clear difference between the way it uh, can be developed. And alternate, uh, on the other hand, you can still make the create these reports that make use of a data that's written, sitting in the server that have to make the database call. And these reports are processed at the server side. In which case, these are become says, server side reports. So that's where the big confusion comes in the in the people mind. Uh, although we call these as a client side report, we can develop these specifically as a client-side reports, but if you design this report to 
fetch the data at the server side and the, the request and response have to make a round trip to the server, then definitely these are no more called as a client side reports than they become as server side reports because the processing is done at the server side. Hope that makes sense. Um, and on the RDL side, RDLs cannot run on the client side. So uh, RDLs need to be deployed on a server and they can be run on the, only on the server side. So that's a clear distinction. They cannot be running at the client side. That's the difference between RDL and RDLC. And RDLC, to create an RDLC, you don't need to have a business intelligence uh, studio, BIDS, whereas RDL, you must have a BIDS to build that report. Okay, what that means is, unless until you install that BIDS uh, as part, which comes as part of your SQL Server database, when you choose to install the uh, SSRS as a component, and again within that you pick the bits uh, when during the installation process, only when that bits will be available as part of your developer machine. Otherwise, uh, it will not be available. So it won't be shipped with the Visual Studio. That's what it means to say. Okay. Whereas for RDLC, it comes along with the Visual Studio, so you don't have to have that explicitly. So there's a big difference between RDLC and RDL. Hope you're clear with that. We'll do that in uh, uh, action so that you have more understanding on that. Okay, so the processing wise as we just uh, talked about uh, for client-side reporting you can make use of the report viewer control uh, that can process the report at the client side. It doesn't have to make a round trip to the server. Okay, uh, whereas for uh, server side reports, you need to have an SSRS. And of course, as I mentioned, you can still have the report viewer that hosts your RDLC file or RPT file. Uh, again, for Crystal Reports, there is a something called Crystal Reports viewer. And for RDLC, this uh, for you have a Crystal, uh, sorry, report viewer, which is for Microsoft. So the report viewer is different for both of these files. Okay, and for SSRS, for RDL, you need to have an SSRS um, on the server side. It's a completely server, as we know, and it's completely a set of services that runs on the server. You need to deploy the RDLs on a server and then run them on the server. Okay, of course, you can uh, integrate that within your application by giving a link to the server side report and then render that report on your browser as well. You can do that as well but ideally it will run at the server side. That's processing wise, there is a difference between um, both. For RDL, for RDL, you must have SSRS. For R RPT or R RDL, you can have a respective report viewer to process it at the client side. And file conversion, uh, if it comes to, if you build any RPT file using crystal reports, then uh, you cannot convert that to RDL. So both are two different uh, animals altogether. So we'll see the content of the RPT as well as RDL and, and we can actually uh, see that right away. Uh, okay, so in Crystal Reports, if I open it in my notepad, I'll pick my notepad plus plus and if we see the content of the RPT is crumbled. It's more or it's a binary content and the format is not uh, human readable. Okay, that's one thing to keep in mind. Another one um, is my reports and in this case uh, I have RDLC. I'll open the RDLC in the same notepad and if you take a look at this, this is in plain XML. So RDLC is a plain XML file, whereas RPT is not an XML file. And similarly, uh, when we go to see RDL, it's also an XML file. So since uh, RPT, the way it is uh, structured out, you cannot convert the RPT to RDL, um, but you can uh, convert a RDL, RDLC to RDL. You can do that. Uh, just in case you have to convert your client-side reports to RDL and host it on the server. You can do that, but not uh, RDLs to others. Okay, so hope that's clear. And now we'll uh, jump into the start the client-side reports using Crystal Reports. Okay, 
Um, before we go ahead and start this uh, kind of uh, very interesting theory be behind uh, crystal reports, um, I had to spend a lot of time to collect this information across various places. Uh, finally, I had this slide made ready. Uh, the one of the key reference point is uh, so it's in wikipedia.org, but unfortunately Wikipedia also did not have the whole information about the crystal reports. Uh, apparently for some reason, but finally I could able to collect this information. So we'll see what uh, we know that it's a business intelligence application and we can design reports and generate wide variety of things and um, what not. You can build uh, crystal reports and if you, you'll be surprised to know that crystal reports at one point is the best reporting tool available in the market uh, way before Microsoft brought the uh, SSRS or uh, uh, into the market. So Microsoft was very very poor in reporting tools uh, at one point of time uh, because they brought the SSRS and other things into the market in the recent times, very well, very recent. And that's the reason I'm very very interested to talk about digital reports uh, than SSRS. So we'll have a history of uh, where it started. It started with the crystal services the firm name called Excel Services Inc. in around uh, 1900s. Um, it's roughly started around 1990. But the version 1 and 3 was developed by Crystal Services. But uh, again, Crystal Services is a project or a product company that has an accounting packages built in. Uh, they work on accounting packages and they did not find any suitable reporting tool. So they started building their own and they uh, worked on the uh, on the crystal uh, services of initially it used to call as a quick reports as we see so the, the first version it used to call as a quick reports and the, I remember clearly when Microsoft has their own tools for reporting in VB6.0 uh, which is the very old one uh, that time they had um, a, a reporting tools called the data reports um, so the data, uh, quick reports and data reports are, uh, are of course relatively okay, but quick reports at the time it's much much better, way far better than uh, your data reports. Okay, so and after that, Crystal Reports got sold to Seagate. Seagate brought the company. It's actually it's like a merger between both the companies, and Seagate um, renamed it to Crystal Reports. So that's when the Crystal Report term started uh, with version 4.0 onwards until version 9. Uh, at this point, Crystal Reports were very, very stable and very, very popular. And probably I started using it um, from version 8.0, if I remember correctly. Uh, and I worked a lot with the Crystal Reports in the past. And really, it's an amazing tool. You won't believe it. Uh, I used the Crystal Report with the Delphi applications um, at that time. And uh, it uh, it has its own uh, application as a studio uh, wherein you can create reports uh, and also you can edit the reports while looking at the output on the designer which is not possible even today with SRS and SR is still evolving and um, even today I don't like the way the IDE for reports in SRS side it's, it's way way uh, far behind right now okay so Crystal is a very very rich uh, tool and of course, it has only OEM version uh, embedded in a Visual Studio. Now, what you see in Visual Studio editing is not exactly what the Crystal Reports uh, whole package is all about. It's a completely studio of its own. Okay, so uh, uh, that's keep it, keeping it aside. So what happened after that is the Seagate and a couple of other companies, namely three more companies, uh, merged together like one of the holistic systems and the crystal services and Seagate, all of Seagate technology. In other words, it's, uh, Seagate has a technology division. So Seagate technology got merged and to become a crystal decisions. Uh, this is a Seagate company. So the crystal decision is the keyword. You will see that even now. So that's the reason uh, even if you go in 2010, uh, forget it. So I have another project uh, where I can quickly go walk you through the namespace here. So this is another project that uh, we we're, going, we're going to see down the line. Under report fever. Yeah, if you take a look at this, the, the namespace is still a crystal decisions. Okay, so this was started way back since then. 
So at this point, um, the company name is still there in the namespace. Uh, that's one thing you will definitely notice. The crystal decisions was a company merged out of all these three companies. So, and uh, and after that, it got merged again with the business objects, which is a very well known name in the in the industry right now. So business objects bought crystal reports, and they developed uh, version 10 to version 12. Um, uh, since 2008, which is a very recent, and most of you might have heard this name in the recent world. And the latest is that uh, now Crystal Reports is merged with SAP, and now it started calling named as a SAP Crystal Reports. And soon after this happened, uh, SAP decided not to go, or SAP decided, or Microsoft decided. It's a different story. Uh, they decided not to uh, ship the Crystal Reports as a, probably it's a Microsoft decision to not to ship um, Crystal Reports as a, a native tool. So until recent time, uh, this is this is the slide that talks about the Visual Studio integration. So whereas uh, Visual Studio bundled the OEM version of the Crystal Reports, as we see in the Visual Studio, the version what we see is not exactly the full version. It's just an OEM version. What it means is the uh, the product of the Crystal Reports is manufactured by another one, another third party manufactured product embedded into Visual Studio. So that's what it OEM stands for. And it's a general purpose as a general purpose reporting tool because at that point SRS is still evolving. And at, uh, so this is a Crystal Reports packaged uh, with uh, Visual Studio.NET 2003 as a default uh, or native reporting mode tool as well as it's shipped with 2005, shipped with 2008. It is still available in 2010 uh, as an uh, as an add-on, but it is not default. Okay, let's take a quick uh, few seconds break, and we'll continue. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is uh, create a Visual Studio 28 project here. So as we see, I am uh, creating a Visual Studio 2008 here. And sorry, okay, All programs, VS28, and we'll see. So since I have uh, I have not installed Crystal Reports as of now in my machine, so it's uh, it's, a, it's as good as out of box to my machine. So in this case, I go with the new project, and I'm uh, in this case I would like to go with the reporting. So since I tried this out uh, before this session, so it's defaultly pointing out to the reporting uh, templates here, and I see two reporting templates here. One is the um, reports application, which is your SSRS. We will go to that part later. So we are interested with this Crystal Reports application. Okay, so this is available. So I can just pick this and say, okay. So what it's going to do is it's going to create the Crystal Reports report application for me. And this is just out of box. And I don't have to uh, install the Crystal Reports uh, runtime uh, that can be plugged into my Visual Studio 2008. So it's still creating the uh, RPT files for me. So at this point, if you see, take a look at the close look at the namespaces we see here. This is the crystal decisions. That's what I was referring to. Um, although the name, uh, the firm has, oh, I'm sorry, the product has been shipped to various firms. Uh, crystal reports is the one uh, crystal decisions to have a signature there. So since it's out of box, uh, we can see that the crystal reports basic for Microsoft Visual Studio 2008 uh, is shipped uh, as a bundle as part of my 2008. So since I'm running for the first time, so I see this um, end user license agreement and uh, I can straight away go and use it. Okay, so it's available. Um, I'll just go with the blank report for now, and yep, yeah. and say okay. 
okay, which is good. And uh, we're not going to jump into anything else. I just wanted to show you that uh, the Crystal Reports is bundled um, along with the Visual Studio 2008. And we're not going to walk through uh, VS 2008 uh, for our demo. Um, so I'm not interested with this project anyway. So I'm going to go from this. And now um, we'll try to create the same project in Visual Studio 2010. So VS 2010 will be short for me. It's easy to pronounce. Good. So VS 2010, um, let's create the same project and see what we're going to see now. I'm going to create a new project. And as you see, under uh, reports category uh, in the templates, I see the same thing, which is um, reports application. This is for SSRS. And the other one is the crystal reports. I just they, uh, pick this option and say OK and it's creating a new thing and um, soon after that so it did not create me the RPT file instead it gave me an MHT file which is a compiled HTML file so what this is saying is that the uh, the crystal reports for if we take a close look at the crystal reports for 2010 is free is a free download so it's it's prompting you that it's not available as an out-of-box bundle, although you can still, the VS 2010 still supports creating a Crystal Reports project in, your, um, in VS 2010, but the Crystal Reports uh, is not bundled as part of your VS 2010 out-of-box. So in this case, uh, what I have to do is, it's, since it says it's uh, free available, I just have to go and download it. And to download it, um, so it, okay, as we know, so it's the browser is completely embedded within the VS One Turn. So I'm going to just go and start my download my free copy, and in this case, I'll go with the standard uh, um, the SAP Reports version for 2010 standard, which is good for me right now, and I'm going to pick the one. Okay, so once it is downloaded, you can just straight away run this. Okay. I'll I'll choose to go with the all defaults. Okay, English. So as we see, it's now completely a SAP Crystal Reports, and it's a OEM version for VS 2010. So, so it's successfully installed. Resume. So what I'm going to do is. So I'm going to start my Visual Studio 2010, okay, and go and say new project. And if you see under reporting on the left hand side, the template side, under reporting there are three project files available in 2010 out of box. So the first one is the report applications, which is for your um, uh, Microsoft reports, which is RDLC. Another one is the Crystal Reports application. Okay. So RDLC, if I uh, if I take the report application and then create project, I don't want to worry about the project names. Okay. So this is the RDLC we have, which is uh, completely client side, and of course by default it's running the wizard to. Uh, do that but right now I'm not interested to write anything here yes I would like to cancel the wizard so we have the RDLC file created here and similarly I'll add another project here picking the crystal reports we're not interested with the WPF right now okay so crystal reports if I pick and say okay it is going to create um,
and uh, okay I don't want to do anything I just <coughs> excuse me okay so I'm interested to see the files here so this is the RPT file when you pick the crystal reports application and this is the RDLC file when you pick the reports application so both are client side reports okay In this case, uh, what we need to do is uh, first get the data source and bind it to the uh, report. And since we have uh, not used the designer or the wizard, I'm sorry, uh, to build this report, uh, so we're going to do it from the scratch. So what we're going to do is get the data from the database table, uh, database fields here on the left hand side. If you, if you see on the explorer. Okay, so right click on the database fields and go to the database uh, expert and uh, I'm going to create a brand new connection now. So using my OLDB ADO and uh, so we'll make a new connection and from the new connection I'll pick the SQL Server provider, OLDB provider for SQL Server and then hit next and I'll pick the server that I'm interested in so which is my SQL server and I'll use the integrated security in this case uh, I configured this database uh, to uh, work with both uh, integrated Windows Windows authentication as well as SQL server authentication um, so in this case it will work for both the cases so I pick the database my HRDB that we created just now and say finish okay so and uh, we're going to make use of this. I'll go to the uh, locate the table and add it to the selected tables list, and then OK. So our database fields are done, and now our, all I need is to make use of these uh, fields on my reports. Just have to drag and drop these reports. Last name. I'll take uh, first name, last name, and the city name. We'll keep it very simple, um, not to complicate. I know the last one is an email ID. Okay, I would rather not to have a city name instead of that because I want to group on the city name. Um, for that, uh, let me take something else, uh, which is a state. Okay, I'll just pick the state. And um, okay, so this is my page header. I'm just bringing that a little close. And also I can go ahead and add some uh, line object here so that I uh, have a separation there. I can do that too. On the report header I can put a text box and uh, say my, I'll say C-R-Y-S-T-A-L report. Okay, so you can do formatting and other things but I'm not I uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on that um, and uh, so w let's run this report and see with the preview uh, if it runs good so yes it, it, it runs good I got the data as well as uh, the things there and another thing is I want to add a, a group on this so how can I do that uh, right click on this say reports and go for a group expert here and from this I can pick a column of field uh, that I am interested in to make it as a group by. I pick this uh, column city and say OK and I got the group uh, created there. So now let's see how the output looks like. If you see the, uh, the city uh, is grouped here and we can see the data drilling down. Um, so just to ensure that the data that you're getting within the details is uh, belong to the same um, city. So what I'm going to do is uh, add the city also to my details list. Okay, so this will uh, ensure, um, okay, I'll just do small. So I can't help myself uh, uh, formatting these things. Um, so I'll try to control myself and uh, do a minimal formatting so that we don't waste too much of time on the formatting side, okay? So there you go. So Ahmedabad I have uh, here and uh, Bangalore I have there and this is group 
part already you will miss the other part yep there you go so this is the group that we have perfect so now we can preview it it, it runs good and um, as we know it's a client side reports uh, these need to be hosted on a UI form in this case the uh, form one uh, has the report viewer here and the report viewer uh, since I created this uh, out of the template so it, it the control does have the association to the crystal report, the report that I'm using here. So uh, this is the report one. This is already associated to it. Perfect. So now what I need to do is save this and uh, start running. Since my crystal report application one is a um, startup project there as it's in bold, I can just hit run. Okay, let's see if it works. So it's broken. So the reason for this issue, so I had uh, before getting into this uh, session, I tried to experiment a lot of uh, this thing and you will see this error in 2010 when we start using the uh, crystal reports, the SAP crystal reports. So the reason behind this is that it's trying to locate a assembly call log for net for a given specific version and uh, this file apparently is there. So this error is actually misleading you completely. So I had to spend a lot of time to figure this figure this out. Um, I tried to look into the GAC where if the file got registered and I found that this is available. If I take a look at in my Windows assembly. So just trying to address this issue. But, uh, this is something that you will definitely come across if you have a brand new installation and brand new setup then this is something that you will definitely will come across. So I just try to uh, um, give you a summary of what this error is and how can we resolve this, okay? And if you take a look at this, there's a log for net and with matching the same uh, token and that, that's that been used here. So everything is there. So there's nothing that it's missing or register. The, the, uh, the DLL is available. And uh, what the problem here is that the SI crystal report uh, does not come for 64-bit. So since my project is uh, mapped to work for, if you take my build option, the target platform is any CPU, what it means is including uh, uh, x86 as well as x64, uh, x86 rather in general refers to a 32-bit uh, processing and 64-bit processing. So since my uh, crystal report references, what all I have, they're all uh, uh, if I take a look at this, uh, the crystal report uh, install runtime, if I take a look at the part where it's referring to, it's actually a 32-bit. So when it says pointing to, and again, and this is something like more like a Windows uh, related thing, uh, it, since my mission is a 64-bit uh, operating system, all the 32-bit operating system files will sit into the uh, program files within brackets x86. And all the 64-bit uh, files will uh, reside under program files. So all the files are, you see under this, they are 64 by default. And if there's anything that's 32-bit, it will fall under the program um, within x86. So what this indicates is Crystal Reports is a 32-bit uh, DLLs that I'm using in my application. And hence, I cannot make my project uh, point to work with uh, any CPU or 64-bit in general. So to resolve that, I just have to switch it to 86. Okay, so that's the uh, simple fix, uh, and um, of course it has a lot of background there. And apparently, I came across the the um, the Crystal Reports, uh, the SAP Crystal Report portal, wherein it says that. It's very, it's very disappointing to hear that you know it supports the 64. It says support 64-bit operating system, but in 32-bit mode. So that's where uh, it roots back to. Okay. So apparently the and the same thing you will also come uh, across um, when you deploy this application to your server as well. Okay. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind. And uh, since I uh, switched the um, platform target to 86, 
it should run it should run uh, let us see there you go so that's the uh, solution and the background of that error and uh, now we're able to run the report uh, and we can see a drill down here uh, on the left hand side uh, wherein you can drill down into the details further perfect so once it is uh, generated the report viewer has the print option here and as well as an export report so export can take you to uh, any format that you would like to uh, render out as a doc or a XLS or PDF um, the output you want to render to your flat file so that you can save it across so this is part of the report viewer the crystal report viewer specifically that's good so we are done with the crystal reports and we're able to add a group and also run it successfully now we'll uh, jump into the uh, the report application which is our RDLC so I'll make this as a startup project okay so we have created this uh, blank uh, report here as we see it's completely blank you can either go and uh, use the report wizard to uh, create the report as well as uh, you can do this way also so okay so report wizard is a very luxury way you can do it and um, in this case uh, if you have a flat blank report um, the first thing you would like to do is either you can go with a table or a matrix a matrix is a kind of a calendar view is um, wherein you have a left hand side group and the top side group and we, since it's just an overview I just will I will go with the table to keep our life simple and we see uh, the, the automatic the the table wizard is open and with a couple of data sources you see uh, using the RDLC uh, all these data sources can be used that's one very good thing about RDLC and uh, where you can use a traditional database um, and also a service if you have a WCF service hosted around and it exposes the data as a service you can directly consume that using the service as a data source as well as the object this refers to the collection inside your um, application itself like employer list uh, that can be consumed directly inside the report you can do that way also and also the SharePoint if you have a SharePoint list on the SharePoint site so you can make use of that as a data source to your crystal reports oh sorry to your reports here so in our case we will go with our, our data database report and uh, and of course at the next next immediate one you can also use the entity framework or the entity data model as well as a data source so we'll go with our traditional data set and uh, I'm going to create a new connection now um, so with this I pick the uh, server name my SQL Express and I'll use the Windows authentication as I mentioned I configure the database to work both with the SQL, uh, Windows authentication as well as SQL Server so either ones will work and I'll pick my database and test the connection and the connection is good I'll say OK and I hit next and the connection is information is going to be saved and it's trying to retrieve the database tables and I have the database tables here you can expand with the fields as well you can pick and choose whichever one you want to include in your report in this case I just pick everything okay and just say finish so this is um, the connection established and the data set is created you can either ch want to change this name you can change it for my demo I keep it simple say okay and now we have the table created there and uh, uh, now uh, how can we add the elements to this report okay as we see there is a small um, icon uh, the help I, uh, the data icon you see there you can just pick the respective name here respective field there and add it to your report it's as simple as that and uh, in this case I'll pick city as well as I want to have the uh, email also so you, as you see by default it gave you only three okay if you want to add a new column on the right hand side go ahead and add insert new column on the right and click hit right and then pick the respective one uh, in this case email address perfect so you can do this way uh, and uh, take it forward 
Okay, I think there are some errors if you see. It's not actually showing the uh, report there. So let's see if it can run. So I'll just build this uh, report and I'll see a lot of errors coming up down the line, downstream. And if you take a look at this, the error says that the respective uh, data set has a name, it does too. Field names must be CLS compliant. So again, this is another thing that you will see when you have these database fields not compliant with the CLS. What does it mean by non-compliant, non-CLS compliant? Uh, what it indicates is it just have to adhere to the naming standards uh, for any fields that you specify. Ideally in a, in a class if you create a, a function name or a variable name, it, it cannot have um, a, a spaces like this. In this case we have a space or special characters like underscore. Uh, underscore you can have it within the name but not it should not start with an underscore. So things like that, um, you have a couple of conventions that you need to follow. So in this case how to fix this? Um, just how to hit on this uh, error then it will take me to the code, uh, the RDLC definition wherein I can go ahead and remove these uh, spaces, the additional spaces that we see here. Um, I'll fix them for all of these fields that are causing this error to make them compliant with the uh, CLS naming conventions to make it compliant. So state province, postal code, country, email address as we see the underscore is valid but not hyphen there. So perfect and I'll also change this home, mobile phone, that's it. So now let me build and see. So I see three new errors, I mean three probably it's old one. Uh, these are going with the expression email address it refers to a field E because of E hyphen. Uh, it's looking, uh, looking for E only. Uh, this is from the RDL. Uh, I'll go ahead and pick the respective one whatever we have right now. So since we change it, I just map the respective one. Okay, this is the last name and the email address here. Okay, so let me see if this resolves the compilers. Perfect. So now I'm able to resolve that and um, as we see there's a comparison between the crystal reports and the uh, RDLC, the client side reports in um, here, you don't see a, a viewer. So as we have the kind of luxury of um, um, having the preview here, there's nothing like that for RDLC. So it's again um, a small drawback there. Um, so you cannot do that um, like the way we did for crystal reports. So for this to happen, we have to of course, uh, of course, need to have the form. Uh, again here and if you take a close look at this, this report viewer is different from the crystal report viewer. This is from uh, reporting wind forms report viewer. On this case is a report viewer which is from wind forms uh, whereas the uh, report viewer, okay I'm sorry. Um, so if you take a look at the RPT uh, within the, okay sorry, the reports here, uh, this is a uh, is a crystal reports viewer. It's, a, it's different from the viewer that we have. It's from the crystal decisions dot windows dot forms dot yeah. So this report viewer is from the crystal decisions namespace and this is the report viewer for crystal reports. Okay, so both uh, viewers are different. Okay, this is from Microsoft as we see. This is from the Microsoft for RDLC. Perfect. So now this need to be associated to the given report and uh, that report uh, is mapped where? It's not there in the property side so it has a code behind. Let's check. Yep. So there you go. So the, the form load um, is refreshing the report and uh, where, where is the association of this respective report uh, done to this report? So if you take a look at this, so this is the report that you want to associate uh, to the report. So choose the report that you want to show it. Okay. Now I associated the report to the report viewer and let me run this um, uh, application and see if it works. 
So every time I play with my uh, RDLC, I have to run the application and see the report is working or not. That's one um, painful thing uh, for developers because you know, you, there's no preview available uh, in your RDLC window, but it's there for RDL, which we're going to see down the line. Um, so that's one drawback with um, RDLC. It's not that uh, user-friendly tool to play with. And uh, since we have uh, done with the, the Crystal Reports to have a group, I can do the same thing with here. Uh, only thing is I have to go and add, a, in this case, I'll just add a page header, a page footer. Okay, let me just do some, okay, some formattings. Not too much, but okay. And if you want to add um, some of the uh, header part here, I can add a header part here, and I'll say my report. My say client side report. Okay. Okay. I just have to pick this. It's a little annoying, you know. Um, uh, to play with the RDLC and never uh, had a good time working with these reports. Um, but yeah, if at all situation demands, then of course you have to use it. So it's not that rich as crystal reports, I would say that. And of course, if you want to challenge that, you can do that. But uh, that's my personal opinion that is not completely intuitive. As you see several reasons I'm mapping to why it's not intuitive. Uh, there's no preview here for you to play with and things like that. Okay. And uh, what else you have? So if you want to add a groups to this uh, uh, table, how can I do that? Uh, just go ahead and select the table and then say, right, I'm sorry, again, I lost the selection there. Uh, select this. Uh, table and then go with the add group and there are two groups you can add one is a column group another one is a row group and I'll go with the row group not the column um, inside the row group I'll say parent group and group by uh, city and I'll pick to have a group header and footer and say okay so now I have the uh, group created there and let me see how this looks like uh, probably this one needs some kind of uh, formattings okay let me do some formatting here so that we don't uh, see a very ugly report there okay and uh, run this report okay I don't see the data there so I see a group there is a problem so I need to probably this these data elements are actually coming down. Uh, yes, so what I need to do is I need to actually add the first name here, last name here, city here, email address here, and I have to uh, literally get rid of this from here. Okay. So this is not a user-friendly tool for reports, definitely, even in 2010, um, it still looks the same as it used to be. So there's not much uh, done on this side. But RDLs, server-side reports, are much uh, richer and much better than the RDLC uh, in terms of uh, how you can um, the, with respect to the developer how they can work with so it still works you have to spend a lot of time on formatting other things and uh, as I see you can have a groups like this and the data on the right hand side so so that's how it is and uh, so hope we hope we are done with the client side reports and uh, as I mentioned I have a very good example already built uh, which will be definitely a very good example here uh, instead of we run this example and uh, show you uh, and then we can walk through how it is implemented okay so as we see this is a typical scenario where you can see a grid this grid is developed using the data repeater and wherein I have a hyperlink on the left hand side uh, given and I hit on the link there and what I see is a report generated out of it and and uh, rendered to the browser as a PDF file 
if you see. So there's no report uh, viewer as such. So we're just making uh, it as a render it out as a PDF file and I see this PDF file created and rendered to the end user. So this is a very good example you might uh, um, want to see. So if you take a look at the excuse me the data. So whatever I picked the uh, data from my database uh, got uh, shown on the report. Okay, in this case I can uh, pick another one here. Uh, in which case I pick the second one which is uh, Shastri and uh, open this and I can see the Shastri name, respective name. So this is a kind of a registration or admission notice in our HR application if it says soon after the um, like for example a student got admitted in a school then the letter goes out uh, in this way wherein you have the employee ID and uh, your customized name here and this is your joining date and this is your employee ID and some images on top of it and at the bottom you have um, the text wherein when it is got generated or things like that information or so that's kind of a hardcore date there uh, and also the page numbers and other things so this is kind of a letter so report can be developed this way also. So this is done using the crystal reports and uh, of course it rendered out. So what I did here is um, I have a XML file as a data source here which is part of the application itself and uh, what my employee list is doing is using a data repeater. Uh, it is uh, uh, binding the uh, data source and creating the hyperlink here uh, for the ID navigating it to uh, report viewer dot as sorry report viewer dot aspx and passing the employee selected employee ID uh, that is being captured on the container. So once that ID is uh, captured and if you hit on that link, it's actually building this uh, URL and navigating to my another aspx page, which is a report viewer. So in this uh, report viewer, I have a crystal report viewer uh, created. Uh, at the design time if you take a look at this. So this is actually making use of the crystal report viewer as we see on the left hand side. So this is the crystal report viewer being used here and uh, within that um, there's a code behind to it okay which is taking the data um, of course it is actually hosting the report file here which is crystal report 1.rpt and uh, which is actually creating a doc and say load the respective report all by code okay and the report file is here this is the crystal report file so this is my definition file for the report wherein I have uh, all the images and the placeholders wherein I can um, populate the data and uh, in the report viewer I'm actually loading that same report there and loading the same data source what I used in my employee list and passing the parameter value there. It's a parameterized report so I'm passing the employee ID as a parameter a value to it and then export uh, the report uh, doc itself has the export to HTTP response. This will render the P PDF. Of course, you can specify which format you want to render out. In this case, uh, the format is specified as a portable doc format. Okay, it has a couple of other formats also, in which case you can see. Oops. Okay, so it's not standing there. Okay, so all these are available formats. So you can render out as a spreadsheet. Uh, or a rich text format or a word for windows and so on. So there are, but it's not too rich, but whatever commonly known or usable, all are available there. Okay, I choose to have a portable document form. So it's so easy to do such kind of implementation. Um, of course, uh, for PDF generations uh, at the server side, there are richer technologies uh, from Adobe side uh, to generate PDFs in bulk and process them. They call Adobe, Adobe Central Pro is one of the central server that can be leveraged. This is a very simple application where uh, we're trying to generate a PDF out of the data. Okay, on the fly. This has nothing to do with um, uh, server side 
things and other things. So that's the one of the good example I have uh, to demonstrate. And uh, so we'll jump into our uh, server side reports. For server side reports, what interesting here is you need to uh, have the SRS installed. And SRS is a server-based reporting platform that provides comprehensive reporting functionality for a variety of data sources. It's the same, uh, blah, blah. And uh, one of the rich thing with the SRS is that it's a service-oriented approach. So once you have the reports deployed, uh, it's available to consume in the applications uh, just like a service calls. So that's very interesting one. You can actually deploy reports using the service calls. You can also consume or run the reports using the service calls. You can run and render the reports in uh, unattended mode like a batch processing or a schedulers. There are a lot of functionalities when you run at the server side. So little history of, about the SRS here. So it started in 2004. The first version got released in 2004 which is very recent. Uh, which is shipped as part of the SQL Server 2000 and it has the uh, bids uh, with uh, Visual Studio 2003. So again the second version got released with the SQL Server 2005 and 2005 uh, which has uh, bids uh, com co compatible with uh, Visual Studio 2005 and again similarly 2008 in the recent time uh, 2008 uh, SQL Server has again compatible bids with uh, Visual Studio 2008 and uh, finally in the most recent one um, is the SQL Server 2008 R2 uh, at which point we have Visual Studio 2008 sorry 2010 and all these uh, have integration with the bids as we see the Business Intelligence Development Studio we are using which we create a size package um, so that has a compatibility with uh, uh, Visual Studio 20, 2003, 2005 2008 and of course it's there with 2010 but again I'm sorry so 2010 doesn't have a bids that's wrong so there is no bids in 2010 so, so that's one thing you might want to know so that uh, there is a problem with bids uh, getting released uh, along with 2010 so that's a very uh, key information that you need to know so people might ask you um, if at all you are looking for an opportunity with SSRS, um, so there is no bids for 2010. So how can I show you that? That can I, I can show you uh, with a very good thing here. I have both here. I have uh, SQL Server 2008, sorry, 2008 R2, and wherein if you if you take it the bids icon, this is a Visual Studio 2008, which is nine, right? My Visual Studio is different, right? So it is actually making use of the uh, Visual Studio 2008 uh, IDE for bits, not the 2010. So it doesn't have, it doesn't ship with uh, VS 2010. So that's one thing uh, you know to you want to know. So now we'll uh, jump into our server side reporting. So to create a server side reporting in 2010, uh, in other words 2008 R2, I have to of course have no other option because there is no bids available in 2010. I have to go all the way to my uh, bids in 2008 which is uh, which ID is, is in 2008. So once I create this, uh, there's another project uh, type you might have seen um, is the uh, report server project. So I'll pick the report server project here and say okay. So this is going to give you just an empty box because I did not pick the wizard to create this so it doesn't have anything out of shelf uh, out of the box. So what I need to do is uh, first I can actually create a shared Anyway, I don't want to go with the shared data sources, uh, data sets because we're going to do one report uh, to demonstrate and I'll just add a new report here and the data source I can um, make and edit this data source one, it's the same SQL Server database, the same connection and same thing. Uh, there are a couple of things that I want to specify here um, for us to schedule a report, okay? Uh, I cannot use a Windows authentication for my database if I really want to 
do a scheduling on this report. There are a couple of restrictions I have. For that reason, I will go with the SQL authentication wherein I have my uh, SQL account to authenticate rather than the Windows account to authenticate. Just trying to remember my password. I hope that's correct. Yep. And uh, perfect. And it got connection succeeded. And we are good. Perfect. So now we have the database connection done. And we have a query builder to build the query. Uh, in this case, I can go ahead and add a table. And uh, there's only one table, we, as we know. And I add this table here and pick all the rows which brings my SQL here and if you know the query then you can straight away key in the query in this case uh, this is fine I'll just say OK and I'll say next and you have a matrix or matrix or the tableau this is the uh, format you will use when you want to do some kind of a calendar type of reports where you have left hand on the topmost we want to go there we'll make a simple tableau report and uh, in this case, we have a couple of things uh, like a group on city here, and also I'll pick uh, some of the fields uh, here in details part. Perfect. So that's all things I don't want to be worried about. And of course, I'll take go with the step and include subtotal, enable drill down, all that. I can ignore and then hit next and finally finish okay um, as we know this is going to run at the server side there is no forms here so there are a lot of differences that you can identify here so to run this report what I have to do is here I can see a preview uh, here for RDLs unlike RDLC RDLC doesn't have any preview we have to put it on a form and then run it to see it and in this case um, once I hit the preview, the report is running and it rendered out. So, so this report is done, okay, which is good. And uh, this is how we can uh, fine tune this report and uh, do a lot of things. Uh, for example, if you want to add, uh, you already have a group on the city here, and in the preview, uh, we can see the report uh, group on the uh, respective city. So what if uh, we, if I want to have a mechanism to filter the report based on a given city? Um, so I can make uh, this report as a parameterized report. In other words, I can also extend this report to add a page header, okay, and also report and page footer. I can add a page header and page footer and also can have additional groups as well if you're interested. Now we don't want to complicate again, right? And toolbox, you will see a lot of rich tools like chart, gauge, and uh, sparkline. These are some of the um, uh, tools available. Uh, the data bar, the map, gauge, uh, sparkline, indicator, all these are the new additions in 2008 R2, okay? Uh, otherwise, those were not available in the previous editions. Uh, previous versions and in this case if you want to uh, decorate my um, header I can of course try and drop an image here import an image file where I can uh, go to my I hope I have some pictures here yeah I'll pick my HR okay Okay, this is very well more than enough for me right now. Okay, I just want to put some logo there and add some text box, say my uh, HR data. Okay, some text. I can do some formatting, all that thing you can do, that's fine. So one of the things I wanted to show is the report data. There's something called the built-in fields, uh, which makes sense if you want to put it on the report somewhere say execution time on this report so we can uh, or rather let me take another one like a page and, uh, so report name probably is the best thing to go here been able to add it here okay it's already there okay I have this report name added of course it's going to be the same uh, name unless I change this 
my HR. Okay, which is fine. And uh, we'll jump into our footer section wherein I can uh, add, uh, say, page uh, number and other things like uh, page number I can put and also my page, my user ID. So some of the built-in uh, uh, things that you can put it here and uh, do a quick test here and see if that shows up. Uh, I can see my RDL name here, my report name, my image and as well I should be able to see my name here, account, my user ID and the page number and the page number should get incremented to 2, yes, and uh, there is a new city added up, so this is what a grouping is doing, and which is fine. So the intention here is I want to make it as a parameterized report, so for that to happen, uh, what, I'll, what all I should do? So there are two parts here, so one is the source where I have to filter data, as well as, as, well as my RDL itself is my front end, as you see there is no form, where you can wherein you can put your text box and pass the value. So my RDL itself is my um, front end. So I have to add a parameter on face of the report on the report itself. Okay, I'll say uh, I'm going to filter on the city, city name uh, to just distinguish it's coming from report uh, report city name. Okay, city name param to keep it more uh, user friendly name. So I just added it and nothing else I'm going to do, just say OK. So it added a report uh, parameter here and in the data source, so this is my data source, so I need to filter my data where city is equal to at the rate city param. So this is the query uh, param, um, within my query I have a parameter, this is how your SQL scripts go, uh, just to test that I can run it in my query builder and it is asking for the param and I say Pune as a city if there is any data, yep, I can see some data there, so there is no wrong with my query, it's prompting for you to enter the param value, so which is good. So now I have to tie this uh, data source um, to the report parameter. So that's where you get into the parameters section there. You see this is a query parameter, a query param, and uh, uh, this is the input that's coming from the report. So I'm tying up both at this point and say OK. So if you understand, so I have to do a create a parameter on the report as well as tie the value from that to the data source and apply the filter there. So the three steps you have to do to make this report parameterized. And now if I hit the preview, I see there is a report city name as a parameter here and in this case I'll put Pune and say view report. And I see the data got filtered for that city. Okay, makes sense? So this is how you can make your reports parameterized. And I'll quickly save this report. Now, this is running in my local. And of course, ideally in a large scale reports, uh, you would like to uh, keep this database connection in the, in the shared database because you might have 10 different or 100 report files using the same connection. So you don't want to have connection created every place. So in which case you might want to have, use a shared data source. In, in, since I'm doing only one report here, uh, I made it in the simplest route possible. Okay, good. So now my development of my report is done. So what I need to do is I need to deploy this to the SRS server. How can I do that? I can, um, at this point you have to go into the server. So now we're going to see how, what you need to do at the server side. Um, so if I go to the configuration tools, I can put a zoom here, this thing really messes, messes me a lot, but let me, okay, there you go, it's not that bad, and within the configuration tool, there's something called uh, report services configuration manager, and I hit that, and I see 
this is my um, SRS server configuration. So I connect it since it's running in my local, so I don't have any problem. And at this point, I have to start my service. My SRS is starting up, and uh, it's successfully completed. Oops, sorry, it's successfully completed. So that means now my uh, SSRS server is running. And at this point, I will see two important things. One is the web service URL, uh, which I configured to this name. And if I hit on this, it, it should open my uh, server uh, service URL. Okay, my password, and I should see my service running. It doesn't show you a WSDL, this is a different kind of a service. Uh, it's running on the server as long as it responds out um, positively, uh, which is fine. So it, it took a long time for me to set up this SRS um, on my machine. It's uh, sometimes the most tedious job to do. Um, it takes a lot of nuts and bolts to fix it to make your SRS server up and running. Uh, especially uh, in the Windows 7 or Vista. Uh, so finally, this is running. So there's no error. All, it's, all it shows me is that the, uh, the service is running. So this is, what, this is what indicates that your service is good to go. And next important line item here is the report manager. And report manager, this is another URL which, which will take you to the report manager. Uh, it, because we have started this sort of service just now, it's going to take a minute, okay, it's quick enough. Um, so this is the report manager where you can see all the reports hosted and run at the server side. And in this case, uh, this this URL, you can very well share it to your um, anyone who want to build reports. Uh, instead of using uh, the, the bids, you can also use the report builder tool and you can do the data source here. You can build the reports on the report manager itself and host it. You can do that very well. And for that, you need to, of course, give the permissions at the site settings side. You need to specify the security and provide the access to the whichever user want to do that. In this case, I made myself as the uh, with all the uh, privileges, which is system administrator, system user, and everything, and all the roles, so whatever roles available as a builder or as a user, everything I assigned to myself. Um, so uh, once I did that, I'm able to get into this home page and access it from anywhere. So we have a security mechanism in place, and the security right now, uh, let's not get too much of server side configuration stuff. Uh, the point of focus here is to deploy my report on this server. And uh, to do that, the first thing I would like to do is create my own folder. This is my reports. Okay, so that I can keep uh, my reports, all my reports within this folder. Um, in a server environment, uh, it's obvious that uh, this can be used by multiple other projects. So in which case, we would like to go with the project specific folder and dump their files here. So there are two ways you can deploy your reports. In this case, I can straight away go into this and say upload a file, uh, in which case I can browse my RDLs, in this case RDL, and there are a couple of other formats it supports, uh, and uh, load it and say OK. So which will uh, do the same thing, like uh, add this report here, and you can configure it and run it on the server side. But in this case, I would like to use my uh, bids to do that. So how can I do that? So this report is running good. I tested in my local. I want to deploy this on that uh, server. So for that, in my projects, if I go and see the project settings, um, so I have the service URL wherein I have to provide the service URL. And the service URL is the one that we have uh, just saw. This is the service. As I mentioned, this service is uh, completely a service uh, driven. So this service URL I need to specify in my uh, project settings here. Okay, that's the step number one. Another one uh, is that um, we have created our own folder within that uh, thing, which is called my reports. This is my folder that I have created for myself. 
and I will give this name in my uh, target data set folder. So all the data sets, uh, sets that I might have here will go into this folder. So it need to go into this folder and the sources, since I have none of them created, so it doesn't matter, it is going to be empty there, but uh, still I will specify them here, okay? And uh, I'm not using any report parts here. You can create a report parts and uh, use it on multiple, it's like your user control where you can reuse that uh, part in different reports. Okay, that's fine. And uh, once you have done this, I'm good. Apply this and say okay. And soon after I do the configuration, I will right click and say deploy. So if you take a look at this, one of the options I have here is a deploy, right? Uh, on the project side and I'll say simply deploy and if I take a look at my output window I can see that the report is deploying and I see that um, deployment one succeeded so there are no fails uh, failures so now I'll go back to my server here and do a refresh and I see the okay because of the name that I specified there it created another folder within that and I see my HR report uh, deployed to my server now and I can run that report here itself Pune, and hit view so it's running the report on the server now the report got generated quite easily so there's no issue so right now I'm not running on my Visual Studio, right now I'm running on the server. So down the line, if someone want to run this report the same way I'm doing, what you need to do is you just have to give them the, uh, the URL of this report. Um, let me go back. Home, my reports my project reports and my HR reports. So you can actually uh, give this as a link um, or you can actually do this uh, link from your application also and ask them to redirect to this page and run the report on the server side itself wherein they can just do the same thing Pune and hit enter and the report get generated and how they want to take this they can uh, either print it or save it in this case if you take a PDF as a save option it's going to generate the PDF and uh, will give you uh, output on the browser itself wherein you can download and print it but all this you can also um, write it from the code the way we have done it for the submission of the the client side report where we generate the PDF out of the form you can do that way also in which case you can make a service call to this uh, server to generate a report for the given set of parameters and then run the report the service will run the report and return you the output whichever output you specify um, one of these and it will give you the uh, report back to the calling application and that document you can render out to the browser or the or the way you want to do it or save it to a file and do it, things whatever you want so you can integrate um, using a service calls so which I'm not covering uh, in this session um, it's going to be take a long time to do that or make my examples ready so it's going to take quite some time um, so this is how you can deploy so next and final thing is the subscriptions so since I have run it so this is one way it took, uh, to consume this report in your application is making the service call and other way is to share this link and provide them the access uh, to this by providing the security permissions to their respective user. Without the security permission, they cannot uh, access this link. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind. Um, so give them the security access and then run them, uh, let them run the report directly on the here, on the SRS itself. Um, and the last thing, so what if you don't want to do both the ways or uh, in enterprise uh, applications, you might come across a scenario where when people will, so many people will ask for reports um, in a day, uh, say if you have a, a thousand users on the application and hundred out of them every day they post a three or four report requests and imagine the kind of load that's going to be uh, applied on the, your database servers 
in addition to the transaction load. So report will definitely take a long time based on the amount of data that it need to process. So such kind of uh, reporting uh, needs where there is a highly transactional system and uh, it has to or reduce the load in the during the during the working day uh, during the daytime. So you want to ship, uh, you want to collect all the report requests during the daytime and process all these requests in the nighttime when there is no load on the transactional database and process them. So that's one of the way you can uh, reduce the load and so that the next day the reports are available for the users to but there is a latency here is that people have to request the report today, they'll see the report on the next day. So that, that's one thing, uh, drawback with that. But otherwise, uh, which is fine. Um, it's all bis if you want on-demand reports or, uh, so most of the reports can say, really wait for the next day. That shouldn't be matter. In such cases, how are you going to do? In such cases, you're going to go with the subscription way. And uh, for this uh, report, if I want to create a subscription, what the sub subscription is going to do is it's going to create a, a time base. In this case, we're going to do a time based uh, subscription. That means I'll specify a given time to run this report at a given time. So but right now it has a parameters, but I'm going to hard code the parameter to do that. Um, but in real world, uh, when I was talking about people can create a number of requests and that request will sit in your transaction database model uh, database as a table entries that so and so user requested for this report with this set of parameters and all of that you can run um, overnight by using a data driven subscription. So data driven subscription I have to do a lot of work um, to better demonstrate I have a simple way to do is uh, the time driven subscription wherein I'll hard code some parameters here and run it. So how can I do a, a subscription here? As we have seen, uh, I'll just hit this cancel. I came to this report and uh, click on this win, uh, drop down and say subscribe. Okay. And after that I see the delivery by. So which method you want to deliver? I have only one here and uh, which is a file share. You can also uh, add the extensions to this uh, delivery mechanism to deliver as an email as well, uh, but uh, I, I did not configure that level. So it's a simple file share and the file name is going to be my HR report and the path where I want to uh, save. So I, I would like to give this path, but, uh, but since this is a server side, uh, it, it won't take you a local path like this. Um, it's going to ask you for a UNC path. Uh, so UNC path uh, refers to the uh, server uh, specific path. So the same path, if I want to make it as a UNC path, it should not be start with the drive name, but it should start with this machine name. In which case, uh, I need to just right click and say share with, and uh, which I have, I believe I already made as a home group on my machine, so this uh, is shared. And I, will, I can actually be able to access it from my uh, machine name is, uh, I think this is the path, or oh, the test data is what, but other way around, I have the drop path created earlier. I can make use of this with the machine name followed by the folder name. So then, that is, that will become your UNC path. Okay, and the render format, I specify it as a PDF, a well-known format, and uh, that folder, if it needs an uh, authentication credentials, since it is on my machine, I need to pass my credentials. And of course, overwrite the existing file if it is already there. And the last thing important here, last two things, um, is when the schedule report need to run. So I'll say select a schedule, and I'll pick an hourly because we cannot wait for an hour or something. I I'll pick a, I'll pick to run f uh, for a minute, and starting from a.m. and it's going to run. For every minute, this report will run. That's what it means. So you can also schedule it based on monthly, weekly, daily, um, because this is completely time driven. So you can specify it uh, this way. Okay. So I scheduled it to run for every minute, and the report param here I'll say Pune, which we have tested, and I'll say okay. Okay. The password again. Perfect. Okay, so the 
oops, there's an error. Say, say the SQL agent server service is not running. So it's important that I have to run the SQL agent. Um, so to do that, I have to just go to my um, 2008 server server and go to the configuration tools and uh, go to my SQL Server configuration manager and I see all these running except my agent so for some reason this is manual that's why it's not started by itself I just right click and say start so the a so what this indicates the scheduler needs this agent uh, to run so the agent will uh, track the timings uh, that you're configured and based on the timing it's going to kick off I'm going to have to give my password and hope all other information is intact. Perfect. Say OK. Yep. So now uh, I believe it created the schedule and I, if I see my, my subscriptions, yes I see my subscription is created and uh, I have to wait and monitor my uh, drop path to see um, for a minute to see that. So meantime before it, uh, the file gets created, um, let us recap if, it, if there's anything that we have to cover uh, today. I think that's it. Uh, this is the once we are done with the subscriptions, uh, which is my last item here. This is server subscriptions. We should be done for now. Okay, so did the one minute pass? Should be done anytime now. Okay, so be, um, before we wait for more, uh, I'll go and uh, take a look at uh, the, I think it's going to do it now. Yep, there you go. So the file got created now and we see the file created. So it's a time driven, so based on the schedule that you set up, it's going to create the file and drop it here. So it's going to keep on running for every minute. Uh, and I don't want to do that so I will delete my subscription right now and the subscription as well you can actually create that using a service call so what all I'm doing uh, here it's all available using my uh, service as well so this service has respect to uh, methods that are available which you can consume in your application and use it. In ideal way you would like to do that is um, if you have 100 different reports you cannot go and manually create subscription for each report so in which case you want to build an automated de uh, deployment tool which can make use of the service SR service call to deploy the reports to the server and uh, configure the necessary settings to do all that. Okay, so that will take care of a lot of things. Another important thing uh, when we deal with uh, SRS or reports, especially with the subscription, uh, you need to, if you go back to the manage um, and if you see the data source, uh, if you go and use a shared source for the data source, uh, it will not uh, work unless until you make the connection um, uh, credentials are saved along with the report. So that's one key thing, uh, your subscription won't work if you have a shared data source. It expects the report to have the credentials saved along with the report so that whenever it's going to run, it need not depend on other uh, shared data sources. So it expects you to keep the credentials saved along with the uh, data source. So that's one thing to remember. And also, it doesn't allow you to do a Windows integrated security as well. So if you have a Windows integrated security, um, then you cannot subscribe um, subscriptions on that report. So there are a couple of restrictions apply when you do uh, subscriptions. And uh, also, there is uh, if you go to the subscriptions tab, there is something called a data driven subscription. So I haven't configured this one. So in this case, as I mentioned that, uh, for this given report, say 100 users have requested 100 reports with variable different parameters. In this case, we have hard-coded the parameter to Pune. So in real time, if that's going to be different for each user request. So that information, you can put it in a database in the transaction model and uh, do a query to get the uh, subscription specific settings. Uh, in this case, the parameter is one of the settings there. So you query your database and pass it on to your data-driven subscription 
and uh, the data driven subscription is going to run the same report for different uh, parameters that and generate individual files for each of the requests and drop it to a folder the way we have done it here. So you should have some mechanism uh, to, uh, to load this file and uh, save it to the way or drop it to the respective inbox or associate to the user so that they can download this file offline. So various mechanisms you can um, bring up to do that. Okay, so, th so that's all about the data-driven subscriptions and the SARA subscriptions and uh, hope um, this is again um, scratching the surface. There are a lot of things uh, involved uh, around the same parameters. Okay, so hope you uh, liked it. We have done with our last session, 35. And in this session, we did see the uh, data integration and reports, which is uh, using ETL operations uh, using SSIs. And we did see client-side reports using Crystal and RDLCs. And also, we did see uh, server-side reports using SSRs and the deploying SSRs reports to the server and uh, also SSRs subscriptions. And, uh, and there were many other topics we covered uh, along with these lines. And uh, we did see the uh, all these SSIs overview, what is an ETL stands for, uh, and also we did see the reports overview uh, uh, with the data and information transformation and the parts of the reports uh, uh, in Crystal with an overview. Uh, but in general, we did walk through all the report definition everything. And also we did see client-side reports and server-side reports, uh, differences between them and benefits over them. And we did the deep dive into the Crystal Reports history in general, uh, wherein it, uh, it was introduced in 92 and uh, in the recent time it's a SAP Crystal Reports. And also we did see the Visual Studio integration for Crystal Reports. Uh, and it's, got, it's a native reporting uh, tool for uh, Visual Studio until 2010. And in 2010, we have uh, SSRS becomes a native reporting tool. And we did walk through the SSRS uh, uh, history and its overview and its uh, Visual Studio integration of various uh, versions and releases of the uh, BITS, which is your uh, business intelligence development studio. And uh, yes, yeah, so this uh, takes the to the end of our uh, uh, whole training uh, program. Um, so with this uh, session 35, uh, we have reached to the end of the training. Okay, thank you very much for attending my training program from my .NET trainer and myself, Shekhar Adipaka. You can keep in touch with me um, after these sessions, uh, either by uh, browsing through my uh, website uh, frequently and also looking at the updates. And also keep in touch with me by writing uh, if you have any questions. If you have not added me to your Facebook, then please go ahead and search by my name and uh, add it and uh, stay connected with my Facebook uh, official page, my.net trainer. I'll keep on posting uh, uh, sh short clips and videos and technical blogs uh, whenever uh, feasible. And I wish you all good luck uh, with whatever you plan to do with all the knowledge base that you have learned from my training. Thank you again and bye for now.